Tony O'Driscoll and Gary Zamchik have created a novel way of helping anyone to think about how they can inspire real change at work in the form of Everyday Superhero, a graphic business book. It was developed by Tony's research at Duke University and brought to life by Gary's evocative illustrations. Hey, friends. Welcome back to the Evolving Leader Podcast. I'm Scott Allender. And I'm John Gomes. How are you feeling today, Mr. Gomes? I am feeling playful, um, and I hope my guests are too. <laughs> How are you feeling, Scott? <laughs> I'm, I'm, feeling, I'm, feeling, I'm feeling playful too. It's a Friday. It's been a good week. Um, I'm feeling really energized, as I usually am, to talk to our guests, but, but in particular because uh, our guests today have presented us with uh, a very, very unique book in the space of uh, leadership. So I can't wait to dive into that conversation with them. We are joined today by Tony O'Driscoll and Gary Zamchik. Today, uh, Tony is an adjunct professor at Duke University School of Business and a research fellow at Duke Corporation Education. During an 18-year corporate career, Tony was a founding member of IBM Global Services Strategy and Change Consulting Practice. He also served as a member of IBM's Almaden Services Research Group, where he investigated the changing roles of leadership, innovation, and collaboration as enterprises become more global, virtual, open, and digital. He's written widely for the Harvard Business Review, Financial Times, and many, many more. And Gary has spent his career working in technology labs, designing firms, and universities. He was a strategic designer with AT&T's lab research, as well as roles and projects in Rockwell, Disney, Coca-Cola, IBM, and more. He's also the illustrator of the best-selling French for Cats humor series of books. Together, Tony and Gary have recently collaborated on the book I mentioned a moment ago, a graphic storybook entitled Everyday Superhero, telling the story of maybe a middle manager on her quest to transform her outdated organization. Gary and Tony, welcome to The Evolving Leader. Pleasure to be here. Thanks so much. We're feeling playful too. Yeah, I was going to ask you how you're feeling. So you, 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 you're you feeling playful, Tony. How about you, Gary? How are you feeling? I'm feeling very playful. I, I think I spend most of my time moving people's thinking into the playful liquid region between <laughs> what they're building and what they're dreaming. So I'm really happy to be in this space with you guys right now. Brilliant. Well, awesome. Let, let's start with a kind of big open question. Um, Tony, what's the single most purpose-driven aspect of your work? People. Well, I think that uh, th this whole book kind of is, is centered around what we call people-centered transformation. And um, I think so often with structure, process, technology, and kind of the automation of everything that we kind of, we fall prey to the tyranny of the tangible. Oh, we're putting in a new process or we got consultants to put in a new system or we have a new technology or a new app. Um, and it's almost like the human beings left out of the change equation and, and, I, I, I subscribe to Peter Senge's argument that says uh, people don't resist change, they resist being changed. If they're involved in the change and they understand the why of the change, then they're happy to change. That's why we're still around and dinosaurs aren't. I mean, we, we are adaptive creatures after all. Uh, but I think we've almost industrialized change to a point where we've dehumanized it to, to, to the point where we don't feel engaged anymore. And we can see this in the literature and the data. So I, I think it's um, rehumanizing uh, the corporation um, and allowing people to to apply their discretionary effort, doing what they want to, not because they're told to. Um, I, I, I really feel we need to kind of reconnect with that. And so that's kind of the, the biggest purpose that drove me to want to do this work. And I also, you know, hanging out with Gary is just plain fun. We, we, we recorded all of the stuff that we did. And, and, and if you edited out the laughter, there was only probably two minutes of substance there. But there was a lot of laughing. So that was good, too, right, Gary? <laughs> That's, That's absolutely right. And, and I learned something really amazing about Tony, which is he can draw. It's just that what he draws are these diagram, thought diagrams. And I tend to draw the people. And mm -hmm. I get into the nature of the experience of those people. So between the two of them, we had structure and focus on characters and so forth. Well, when I told John I was giving him a graphic novel, he got very excited because he can be quite graphic. But um, he... Uh, <laughs> the wrong kind of graphic. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you said before we, we started recording that, um, that you started off writing, you know, kind of, I, I forgot the adjective you used, or the, mm -hmm. but just kind of a standard... Uh, business book in a way in terms of its yeah. format you know when did you decide that this needed to be something different because it's it's really unique and very cool 
Well, thanks for that. We, we appreciate that. This is just very early in the journey of the book kind of being seen by other folks. So, so really appreciate you saying that. Um, it started out where I was actually asked by the Project Management Institute uh, to kind of take a look at a problem. And the problem was, you know, 70% of strategies don't succeed. You know, it's not that they're not well-crafted. It's just that they don't get executed. And, and the first thing I pointed out was, well, the word execute can mean to do or to kill. So the problem is that these strategies are getting killed more often than not rather than executed. And why is that? And, and what we found, that was me doing the academic stuff, was, was, was again, uh, we, over, we over-rotate on the structural side of things and not on the human side of things, right? So we don't look at the emotional aspect of change and the human aspect of the change and the EQ aspect of change, Scott, which we were talking about a little bit before we came on the air. Um, and so, so I, I formulated a framework called the People-Centered Transformation Framework and tried to integrate all of the latest research around these 10 elements. And then uh, Martino Sullivan from, from Random House said, I think you've got a book here. And I said, great. And so I started writing it in the traditional, you know, academic and literature and quotes and citations. I think the first, the first draft of this thing I had had about 250 references in it. You know, it's kind of like mm. very academic. Uh, and, and she's the one who said, look, if this is about people-centered transformation, I think we should do a story. And I said, a what? <laughs> she said, you know, a story. I said, no, I don't know. And so then I went and learned about Joseph Campbell uh, and started, oh, wow, every, 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 every movie I've ever watched kind of follows a formula. I didn't know that. Um, and, then, and then the idea was, well, we should maybe illustrate the story. And I had the great privilege of working with Gary for over 20 years. Um, we actually turned in a strategy to IBM that was a 180 page, for want of a better word, comic book. And that was a little unique at a place like IBM where we had kind of a digital learning strategy that was essentially uh, lots of people in pictures. And so so we came together and um, once Martina started to see the really cool way that Gary can bring characters to life, she said, okay, we're going, we're going full graphic novel. And so that's kind of the genesis, Scott, of how that how that emerged. I think we basically invited, uh, well, Tony invited Joseph Campbell into the room and he became kind of a third collaborator. Mm -hmm. And I, I couldn't believe, you know, how, how beautifully we could map kind of these deep principles, some of them dark, like the rules that a, uh, that a, a strong centralized leadership would, would enact. And many of them, this uh, shift to a, a much more people-centric transformation view. So um, yeah, I was really excited about that. And I mentioned before we got on the air that uh, I had to up my game. The, the little whimsical drawings that Tony was used to me doing for years, I said, that's not gonna fly here where we have people who are uh, subject to world-threatening straits. And mm -hmm. so I had to come up with real characters that are embedded in a real story. And that's how we brought uh, maybe our heroine to life and all the other characters that are uh, weighing on the story. So Gary and, and, and Tony, give us your pitch. Who is it for? What are they going to get from it? I mean, I, I read it. It took me a little longer than an hour. It took me about an hour and a half to read it. I know Scott's still reading it. He, he does a couple of pages a day. Yeah. Um, ADD. But, <laughs> you and me both, Scott. <laughs> yeah, just give it, give us the give us the pitch. I think it's for anyone who wants to make a difference. I mean, honestly, I, I don't think you know Gary and I did this just for fun, I suppose. Um, but sometimes there's wisdom and humor, and and I do believe for the younger generation, I think the the kind of the graphic rendering of it could be could be helpful. And I think if you're if you're newly in an organization, perhaps newly promoted, and you're having to now not just deal with doing what you're told, but you know, having some uh, accountability for others who might in the hierarchy report for you, that it could be quite accessible. I think for more senior leaders, because there's a whole kind of um, articulation of the mucks, you know, there's the, there's, there's the muck, uh, there, there, there's six or seven of them, but Stuffy Muck is the procurement officer, Wizzy Muck is the innovation officer, Bucky Muck is the financial officer. So, I mean, we kind of, obviously archetypally put these roles in place but it but if you have that kind of leadership system hopefully at the front end of the book you see over time how corrosive that can be mm -hmm. to creativity and, and so i think there's also messaging in there in terms of if your behavior looks like this you you may actually be doing the company disservice so it wasn't necessarily we, we didn't approach the book like oh who's our target segment and what are we going to do we kind of approached it more like there's a narrative but i think because there's different characters at different ages and different 
you know, cycles of life, it, it could probably speak to most people um, in terms of what they could do more, better, or differently to make change more human. Yeah, I, I think that there are people responsible for making incremental change happen within a corporation. I think this book encourages people to raise their eyes above what they're working on, not be just caught within that space, and to make leaps in their thinking, because mm -hmm. you realize that the tools that will get you to a certain level aren't going to meet the, the needs of the solution. So the leaps can come from the a guy that you meet on the elevator. You know, someone just happens to be in the room and says, oh, what about this? And, and you see several examples of that in the book where uh, leaps come from other industries, someone who had worked at a toy company beforehand and brings that knowledge into play here. Um, and it can also come from the newbie, uh, one of the characters who's uh, sitting there and has more of a, a finger on the TikTok generation and he understands what might bring about that change so let, let's just go back a step um and maybe tony and, and gary can tell us is you know this idea that organizations have industrialized change and there's a whole you know industry that's brilliant at you know the process pieces and the logic around data and all that kind of stuff that that they do to to create new organizational development models where is it for you personally not intellectually, but personally, you kind of had that moment and you thought, oh, the human piece is really missing. In our experience or in the research? Well, I'm just thinking, did, was there a story or was there a personal experience that you had that made you feel differently about this? Oh, definitely. Personally, um, there's been a number of times, both because I had a 20-year corporate career before the going into the academy. And I would also say the academy has its own issues with change. I mean, if you want to think mm -hmm. about it, it's probably the one industry that hasn't changed. If, if Socrates walked into my classroom at Duke, the only question you'd ask is, why is the whiteboard not black? I mean, the, the, the setup's kind of sort of the same, if you know what I mean. Um, and I've been a person like Gary, I think we both share this, where we've always been trying to push the organization towards the edge. We're, we're the innovators, you know, we're the crazy ones, if you want to you know, adopt the whole Steve Jobs mentality. Um, and that can be exhausting. It can be really, really tight because the, the, the force of inertia in the center of the corporation, kind of the, the, the unconscious kind of collusion around the status quo is really, really hard to, to kind of um, to have the resilience to continue to want to combat if you want to be more combative in the language. Um, and, and I used to just ask myself, you know, I, I, ran, I ran a lab inside of a, an organization and essentially today, just now, the very last person who, who we worked together left. And I said, wow, that's the end of an era. And, and, and I felt terrible because I felt in that organization, they really lost the people who are going to have the capability to take it forward. And I'm very concerned that um, today, I, I, I think companies no longer compete on scale and they, don't, they no longer compete on speed. I, I think they're going to compete at the rate of imagination. It used to be how, 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 you know, how quickly can I get big? And then it's how quickly can I shift or can I morph? And now it's how quickly can I imagine? Because... Those other two have been automated. I mean, if, if we want if we want to have an agile system, we can implement an agile system. So now we're going to be competing on imagination. And I don't know any AI that imagines. I know Gary imagines. I know you all imagine. And we can see a future heretofore never even imagined. So how do you write an algorithm for that? And so I, I really do feel that um, we're going to come full circle here where new values are going to be created through the possibilities that people conjure up in their mind. And, and we need to create an environment that allows that to happen. And that's a little bit of the genesis. We wanted to describe that. Mm. So, so describe that a little bit more, if you wouldn't mind. What is the <clears throat> environment that produces, you know, a, a competitive edge of imagination? Mm. Right. Well, I think that there's there's ten elements. So this is where we could get a little a, a little geeky on it. But I I think the first thing is we have to redefine what leadership is. Um, I think too often we think leadership is a noun and a person in a hierarchy and not a verb. Uh, leadership is a system like any other system. And, and the way that I conceive of leadership is there's one and only one requirement that's universal around the world for leadership to happen. And that's that you have a follower. I walked my dog earlier this morning. I was a leader, <clears throat> the dog was following me. And I think any person in any organization at some point in time will lead. Even the janitor, Kinect, who's the character that, uh, that we have in the book, 
lowest person on the totem pole, most important person from a connectivity perspective. That's why his name is Connect. Um, and so I think everybody now has an opportunity to lead and, and recognizing that and allowing that to emerge because we're now in a more of a complex adaptive environment. That's the first kind of mind shift. I know you talked about, you like to talk about mind shifts. I think that's the first one and the shift is leadership's not a person or a noun, it's a verb. And it's about the actions and interactions between people and, and moving from knowing when to do leader and follower. Scott, I know your background's in music, right? Um, if, if you're listening to a, a great jam band, you know, in the tradition of the Grateful Dead or Fish mm -hmm. or these kind of bands that just go, they, who's leading? And how do you mm -hmm. know when to pass it along, but it's still experienced as a complete whole? That's a very different system of leadership, jazz or that kind of music, if you will, than an orchestra where somebody's really trying to get everybody to play on note and on pitch. And, you know, both are beautiful, but there's a different leadership system at play. And I would argue that the jam band jazz uh, system takes you in further and different directions. And therefore we need that kind of leadership system to complement what we have um, in the regular organization, which would be manifest as the MERV. So let, let's, um, let's walk us through the story, you know, the high level of the book. And, okay. you know, and how you got to, you know, the, the protagonist. It might be worth also, because some people might have heard of Joseph Campbell, but just tell us a little bit about him and, you know, the, uh, you know, why you drew upon that, you know, storytelling model. So, so I got introduced to, to Joseph Campbell actually through a, a conference I went to, uh, Techonomy. It's a big Silicon Valley conference. Uh, David Kirkpatrick runs it. And, and one of the things we got to do was go to Skywalker Ranch. And so we got to, you know, learn all about... And, and I, 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 this is very interesting because I'm originally from Europe. And so I never I never got kind of really introduced to Star Wars. The first Star Wars movie, the first movie I ever saw was a Star Wars movie, but I never got into the whole six movies and so on and so forth. But then my son uh, just fell into the rabbit hole about the Star Wars. So he couldn't believe it that I actually got to go to Skywalker Ranch. And, um, and that's, of course, where I learned about Joseph Campbell and that there's the hero's journey that he's essentially, you know, looked at all the different myths and essentially formalized it into there's an ordinary world, there's a challenge that comes along, you have to cross the first threshold, which means you have to deal with overcoming your, your own, you know, crap, if you mm -hmm. want to call it that. Then there's a road of trials, and then there's the big moment. That's where Dark Vader and Luke kind of head off against each other. And then there's the road back. And then as you return with the elixir, and then, you know, we're back into ordinary world. So that's a very, very crude and short narrative of kind of how you would go through Joseph Campbell's story. And, and, and as I said to you before, and Gary knew this story, I didn't. So now whenever I watch a Hollywood movie, I go, oh, well, when's the ordeal going to happen? And, oh, that's the, yeah, so the, that's that person. So in a way, uh, it was very, very helpful for me because this is not my domain. But then where Gary came in was, OK, so now we need this character and this character needs to show up and we need a motif. I'm like, what's a motif? He's like, well, we need something to represent. The predometer would be a great example of a, a motif. It's right. You know, and we even thought about the word. It's prod, prodometer, and it's also productivity. We're prodding you on productivity. That's the predometer. Whereas on right. the other side of the book, it's the mojometer. How much mojo is there in the people? So, so even there in the motifs, we have kind of the difference between an operating system that measures and prods versus an operating system that kind of tries to tap into the energy of people. So we tried to we tried to build that in. So we found it as a very good structure to build upon. But then that's where Gary really came in and just brought. You know, I have the conceptual ideas, but that Gary brought them to life. Well, we you know we 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 were going to focus on a disruptive event. And we knew we wanted this to be focused on a company. So we came up with an idea for a FUD, uh, a field undulating disturbance, right? That throws the world into turmoil. And there's only one company really that has a technology that might address uh, this challenge. And they have to start manufacturing these things. And I, I was blown away, Tony, Tony made sure that we kept track of the numbers of these things that we were developing because 8 billion people on the planet had to get a hold of one of these figs, a field inversion gyroscope, so that they could be protected from the uh, massive event that had occurred worldwide. So um, we, the other thing that, that is very central to Tony's thinking is that 
uh, companies improve from the middle out. And he can speak a lot more to that than, than I can, but that's why we chose a character named May B, because it's not always a given that it'll succeed. But here is where Tony found that's where our, our heroic story had to begin. So there's a lot of kind of archetypal imagery and yeah because you're trying to get something really kind of visceral and embodied in the story aren't you that's right and and then the hard part for me there john was i so i knew the research and i knew the elements right of what a people-centered transformation was and then i knew the shifts behind the elements but then telling the story and having them emerge naturally in the story that was the tricky bit was to kind of like make sure that we covered all the pieces but don't um, let the story lead. Don't force the, the, the researchy stuff. And so that, that was probably the biggest creative fun for us was we, were, we, we had a three-dimensional Rubik's Cube kind of sort of we had the, 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 the structure that Campbell provides in telling a story that, that's accessible to people, the kind of research piece where we want to get across certain shifts in behavior, and then the characters and the motif to make it all come together. So, so there's a lot underneath there. It took, it took us a long time more to kind of figure out the connections than it did necessarily the research itself. Right. But, but that was the fun part of it, I think. At least it was for me. Tony mentioned, you know, a 3D Rubik's Cube. We literally came upon a 3D Rubik's Cube through a character that we had called Trickster, mm -hmm. who really understood the, the nature of the corporation and how difficult it was going to be to bring about transformation in that environment. So we recognize that the building itself becomes an architectural motif that supports the story and transitions that May makes as the in-betweener between the, the muckety-mucks way at the top and the people who are actually designing a solution. She has the visibility into both those environments so that she can uh, bring about the most change. First, as an agent of the mucks, until she realizes that's going to fail. And then as an, a real agent of change who gets help from, as Joseph Campbell would say, a mentor uh, from the future who helps her understand the types of shifts they have to go through. T tell us how you two got together and what the experience of, you've given us a little taste of the experience of it, but you, you've obviously had a great deal of fun in, in doing this. <laughs> how, how did you get to know each other? I was embedded at IBM, and I, I at that time I had responsibility for leadership strategy, uh, learning and leadership strategy and performance. That so more the strategy side of aspects. So I, I reported into uh, the chief learning officer. I guess would be what we call out today. Uh, Nancy Lewis was her name, and um, Nancy found me inter terribly frustrating because I, I I would get my work done in two days, that what was required of me for her, and then I was doing a whole bunch of. Um, other stuff inside of IBM, mostly focused on the metaverse at that point in time, the original metaverse, the second life world and all that. So I was doing a lot of, I was an academic, so I had a, I had a research appointment. So I had a day job, but I was spending more and more time doing my, my, my other job. I was following my curiosity more. Uh, and she, she was getting, she's like, you, you need to do more of this and you need to do more of that. I'm like, I've done it all. And she said, okay, well, we're now we need, we need a whole new strategy and I'm going to introduce you to someone. So I think she had, the, she had, she had the, what, what I really love about Nancy, she, she knew that if, if, if she put me with Gary, I'd spend more time working on the stuff she wanted me to work on. Uh, and that's where we got together. She introduced us. I don't ex ex exactly remember how, how Gary knows Nancy. And, and then to her credit and, uh, and to the organization's credit, they allowed us to work together in a very unique way to craft a very forward thinking learning strategy for IBM that essentially, it wasn't a graphic novel, but it was certainly a graphic rendering of how we believed the strategy should emerge. And, and this was before design thinking and customer empathy and touch points, but essentially that's what it was. Here, here's what the learning experience might be for an IBM or what the digital part of it is, what the physical part. And we, we just had so much fun working on that together. Uh, then I, I, I have a lot of speaking engagements and, and, and I would just say things to Gary and you can make a picture and then people just love the pictures. So, so honestly, Gary and I have collaborated for over 20 years um, literally, I'll be on a plane. I'll say, "Hey, Gary, I, I need to say this." And by the time I land, there'll be a picture. So it's it's we've had a very very yeah. fruitful collaboration. It's been really rewarding. You know, 
I, I'm used to chronicling and capturing what people say, sometimes in real time, sometimes after someone's given a talk, I create these kind of elaborate uh, compositions that describe the nature of that talk. But when I got on the phone with Tony back then, and we were only on the phone, and we generated a 180 page book together on on demand learning at IBM, it was still like uh, it was like nothing I'd ever done before because Tony, Tony makes a lot of sense. Rapid fire, rapid fire. He's very he's, he grasps what is very strongly, and I'm kind of more about what if. So I I think I'm a a predometer of sorts for Tony. I kind <laughs> of push him into the realm of. But what about this, Tony? And even if it's a silly or kind of a, a, a ridiculous idea. Tony takes it, takes it seriously, and always brings it back to something meaningful. So I, I've just been very fortunate. That was a transformative event when I met Tony. Well, it sounds like a very interesting uh, creative partnership. T talk, talk us a little bit about how it works in terms of because I'm, I'm fascinated with you know kind of opposite types working together like this, mm -hmm. and you know well, the, the the highs and lows of this process. Well, how, how, how does it go? Let me open with. You know, I think that Tony really lives the, he lives the principles that we are embedding in this book. I, I think he's very matter of fact. He's very humble. He leads with, you know, am I making any sense here at all? You know, and I can't tell you how that makes me feel and lets me come out and generate uh, the best that I can do to, to meet the, the ideas there. That kind of humility and vulnerability that may our, our our heroine ultimately has to express in the book in order to get the people in the book to follow or not follow but go along with where uh, the changes have to go. So um, and he's also, as you can see, develops a very clear and compelling narrative, and that leads you up to the water. But then you have to go and and develop the ideas that are there. Yeah, I would say there's no. For me, there's no downs. I mean, it, it's honestly just been, I don't know. We, we, we've recorded all these Zooms and I, I, I'll tell you, there's just never so much laughter and, 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 and um, you know, there's no failure. It's just, oh, whip, whip, we got to back up from there and move in this other direction. And we learn something from that, you know, um, uh, and, and, and I'll tell you for sure, it's emergent that it, neither of us could have ever articulated what the narrative was going to be, who the characters were. We went into this just, um, you know, not holding any prejudgment as to what's going to happen and just truly let it unfold. Uh, and I, 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 I it, it's just really hard to figure out who's, who's, who has what part in this thing. It's, it's kind of, there's a little bit of both of us in every part of this thing. And, and I think that that's truly co-creative. I think that that's, um, that's part of, you know, why it was such a joy to put together. I'll give it's you right. an example. You know, you have this idea of a merb you know, a, a Mux immutable rule book that they deliver and say, execute on this, you know? And I had to translate the MERB in a way that made a lot of sense for this book. And I, the first thought I had was, you know, Soviet style propaganda posters. So all of a sudden the other drawings were people going through their routines. And then all of a sudden those posters took on this style that was very intense and heavy at least from a Zamchikian point of view. <laughs> and uh, then I was doing drawings that were about imposing hierarchy or demanding foolproof plans or centralizing decisions. And it made a lot of sense in the, in the Soviet, you know, playbook. Uh, so, and Tony, to, I don't, I don't, it's very rare that Tony says, no, Gary, you've kind of missed the point here. I mean, we're almost always exactly on the same page. I think we vibrate at the same frequency. The the Meyer Briggs test. Mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. Tony actually said we're the same in that regard. So yeah. somehow we found a, a. We're lucky when we find. It seems like you guys may have found that collaboration as well. But we're very fortunate to have found that connection. Well, it's really neat to to listen to your mutual admiration and respect and gratitude for one another and uh, I can see why you produced what you produced. Can we hone in for a moment a little bit deeper on the central issue of change because I'm mindful that you know in doing what I do I, I have conversations continually um, 
uh, on this idea of change. I feel like it, it's kind of dominated and perplexed people and organizations for, for years. And there's so many workshops and books and theories on what is it really going to take for us to be a, a, an organization or a team that can change and evolve. And, and you said something early, Tony, at the beginning that people don't fear change. They fear being changed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I've also thought of it as, you know, people don't fear change. They, they, they you know, they fear what they're going to lose in the change. Mm -hmm. I'm curious if you found any of, of that sentiment or if you feel that it's really comes down to people losing their autonomy, that they want some sense of autonomy and, and voice and choice in the change. There's a lot of ways to take that, Scott. Let me see. I'll go one way and see if this works. If not, we'll go, we'll go another way. So I, I think that um, we can go to biology for this. Adrian Slowoski wrote a fantastic book called Why Zebras Don't Get Ulcers. I don't know if you've ever heard of this book or seen it, but, but, but essentially he said, uh, you know, zebras don't get ulcers because they're sitting out in the Serengeti Plains and they're munching on some grass and they're happy. And then they hear a noise and then they see a lion and they run. But they're not saying to themselves, oh, my gosh, is the lion going to get me? They're just running. And then they kind of forget why they're running because they don't have this internal dialogue with themselves. They're not aware of the me and I. You know, we say to ourselves, I talk to myself. Well, I go, who's I and who's myself? Like we have this little voice inside yeah. our head. And so and so then they stop and they go, oh, there's some more grass and they start eating. So they're not they're not in this kind of Stephen Covey was a great mentor of mine. They're not in this state of worry about, you know, oh, I did something really stupid in the meeting yesterday. What should I have done about it? And they're not in the state of worry about, well, what am I going to do with the COVID pandemic? So, you know, we're, we're constantly being drawn away from the present, right, mm. through, this, through this psychology. and But it's also biological. So, in other words, when we are faced with a change situation, the lion just showed up. Biologically, what happens is the blood moves from our prefrontal cortex to our legs. Why? Because... From a biological perspective, this is what Adrian taught me: is we have we have to have more oxygen and, and blood in our legs so we can run. Well, mm -hmm. that 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 causes us to not be able to think. The prefrontal cortex is about kind of decision making, so we go limbic, which means that we fall back into what we've known before. And so, if I've been a leader for a long time and I've moved up a hierarchy and I've learned the MERB rule book, the Muck Immutable rule book, those sit in the limbic part of my brain. Those are the things that get executed without questioning. And so I, I, when I'm faced with a challenge, doing something different than what I have to, or a disruptive technology comes, or COVID hits, or the great resignation is happening, or, 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 these are all just change situations that create a challenge, we tend to fall back into demand fail-proof plan, measure outcome, impose hierarchy, require conformity, centralize decisions, maintain control, monitor activity, demand performance, project power. Mm. It's almost like that's our default. Even biologically, we have to fight millennia of biology to kind of even get into our prefrontal cortex. And then maybe that's not the right answer. And that's part of the problem, I think, is that left to our own devices, we'll fall into the status quo. We know this. So then, so then how are you going to take that on? What are this? We know this from BJ Fogg and I, I shouldn't, I'm going more academic now. So all the literature and the research, but BJ Fogg, uh, James Clear, all this micro persuasion, small habits, atomic habits. What's one small thing you can do today? One small shift. And then if you do that for 21 days or so on and so forth, you, you'll, you'll, you'll close, you almost have to retrain your brain, right? You have to unlearn some things and relax some things. So in the way that we structured the book, we're like, the MERB is the status quo. And 99.9% .9 of the time, we're going to fall into that just because, you know, biology is stacked against us. So then we need, we need to understand how to recognize a situation and then what shift we have to make. So for instance, I'll give you, this is my classic because, you know, those of us who are parents will know this. This morning I said to my kid, kid, clean up your room. So I'm demanding change behavior, right? Uh, and guess what? The room's not going to be clean today or tomorrow. And the reason for that is when I go into my room, there's crap all over the floor. So why is it that I would demand change behavior from my kid when I'm not demonstrating the change behavior I want in my own behavior? And, and at the in the end, as a leader, what you do feeds, speaks far more loudly than what you say. And so, so in, in the, first, the first challenge, I think, in leadership to move from kind of being this murbified leadership, this you know, centralized command and control leadership, to being more open is, is to be humble and to be vulnerable and, 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 and to demonstrate the change behavior. And in fact, when in the book, when May does take up the leadership mantle, she doesn't say there's a new sheriff in town and this is what we're going to do now. She said... 
I have no idea what we can do, but I do know that the people in this room are the only people who can figure it out. It's almost like the moonshot thing, you know, how do we get, how do we get the, how do we get the spacecraft back around the moon? That, that took a whole bunch of people bringing all of their expertise together to solve a heretofore never seen problem. Well, I think that the future of the world is heretofore never seen problems. And that anybody who claims that they know exactly what to do um, is delusional. It, it, it can't be possible. So we need a different kind of leadership system that taps into diversity of perspective and that finds their way forward, back to the music metaphor, Scott, in a jazz and improv kind of way so that we can keep on keeping on. And that's a different leadership metaphor than I got this, do exactly as I say, and we'll get through this. Right. And, and Tony and, and Gary, in your experience, who's getting this right? Where are you seeing evidence of, of the kind of change that you're talking about being successful? From my perspective, um, the arts. And this is another reason why I really like to work with Gary. Um, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Very much into the music stuff and trying to understand what is leadership. So Martha Mook and I've, I've talked to a number of, 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 of musicians, ja more jazz musicians or improv musicians, improv comedy artists, because there's there's if you think about leadership as a system where sometimes you lead and sometimes you follow, but you, you both have a common aspiration. So in improv, the goal is keep the conversation going. And, and so that's the shared aspiration. And they can be very creative in that. Uh, sports is also quite interesting in terms of, you know, how is it that one, in, 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 let's talk about English soccer, for instance, how is it that one manager can come in and kind of with the same set of players change and change the context so that they can bring their fullest selves to work? Uh, that's another area uh, that I think you, you can kind of find it. The, the deepest work I did, you know, for this research that didn't necessarily make it into the book is, is an amazing dance troupe called Palabolus. If you've ever seen Palabolus, but if you if you see them, they defy they defy what dance even means. They're just incredibly creative, and and they have a set of rules that actually informed a lot of what we did with the with the people centered transformation framework. They have a whole set of kind of rules that they apply in order to be super creative. And the interesting thing about Palabolus is they're now they're not just a dance troupe anymore. They designed the scoreboard for the Mercedes Benz Arena. They 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 did a installation at CES for Ford Motor Company because they're applying these same rules of creativity. It's almost like engineering knowledge collisions, engineering accidents purposefully to kind of find new ways forward. And so I think actually the the um in design thinking, we, we call this kind of uh, analogous experiences. You know, if you want to learn how to set up an EOR, maybe you want to go see Formula One race car shifts, you know, because you could learn some practices from that. I really think the inspiration for the organization of the future might actually come from more of those uh, co-creative arts, uh, sports performance kind of context than maybe within an organization itself, mm -hmm. a, a traditional company. If you will. Yeah, I, I think, I think, you know, design thinking has become a core innovation engine for banks and technology companies and, and the like. Um, teams of people getting focused on the real needs uh, that people have and developing products that meet those needs. Um, I just think also that so many startups are, are rising up and I think they are focused in kind of a a multilateral way on what's needed to meet the needs of a, a very targeted audience uh, often. Uh, and certainly large scale changes like the hybrid office is disrupting things right now dramatically and the metaverse and the need to move to metaverse and NFTs and, and the blockchain, all these things are disruptions. And I think that uh, people are starting to come up with very creative ways to meet those needs. Um, and to put people at the center of those, those challenges. If you're enjoying The Evolving Leader, please head over to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review. And don't forget to follow along on Instagram and LinkedIn. You can find us at Evolving Leader. Thank you for listening. Now, let's get back to the show. One thing I'm interested in is kind of reversing the lens where you know the organizations the, the commercial organizations have been driving the change agenda but the markets are now kind of coming together and communities are coming together to actually you know do it the other way around you know they're the ones that are shaping you know the the environment 
mm-hmm. and those those kind of platforms that are being enabled by certain platforms, social platforms, and and uh, you know uh, things like eBay and so on. Um, what, what do you see there in terms of how the change works in an organization when the market is actually, if you're not connected to the market in that real time sense, you really don't know what to change. How, how does that how does that influence your your thinking? There's a lot in there. So, so I think I think um, the at, when when we connected everything up, right? Uh, and I'll go back to Kevin Kelly. So Kevin Kevin has a really nice metaphor about this. He, um, when, 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 when 2008 happened, right, with the global financial crisis, mm-hmm. I mean, essentially what we have there is we have a, a, a and this is, this is current and contemporary now with, you know, when, when, when the West shut off SWIFT for Russia, that meant money didn't flow. Like, that's essentially what it meant. It's not really money. It's just bits floating around in the ether. Mm-hmm. Um, and, so, and so when you have money being tracked and floating around the ether at the speed of light, and suddenly the U.S. market goes belly up. Well, it's one what the way Kevin talks about it. It's one financial heartbeat. You could literally see the Hang Seng Index and the FTSE Index and every other one. The, the world had a financial heart attack at the same time. Why? Because we're connected. Because the whole world was connected, and and you know it might be a dollar to you or a stock to me, but essentially it was just represented as bits in the system. And so the world has essentially evolved into becoming a complex adaptive system. Right. And, and then companies, markets, right, uh, companies operate inside markets. And one of, one of the theories of, of companies is that um, uh, you can organize inside of a market by specializing and having resources and capabilities. And, and you have a, an efficiency of scale inside that market. So if you're a Ford Motor Company, you come up with a way to build a Ford Model T, you can extract value from the market by, by being a bigger entity. Right. And Coase, Ronald Coase, the Nobel laureate economist, kind of talked about how big would a company get? And he said, well, that's very easy. A company will get as big as the transaction cost inside being cheaper than the transaction cost outside. So what does that mean? If I'm Ford Motor Company at one point in time, I would import sand. Why would I import sand? It was cheaper for me to import the sand and then have my employees make the windshield. That is not the case anymore. It's far easier now in an Internet ecosystem where search costs go down. For somebody who's close to the sand, who has capability about building the sand to build the, to build the windscreens to spec, and then Ford just installs them. So because we created a information ecology and a set of platforms like the Ebays or the Amazons or the um, uh, or the uh, Huawei's, if you will, um, there's a far less friction in the system. And then what what you see is organizations are going to shrink around their core competence and they're going to connect with with the complementary capability to deliver value sooner. And so the market forces are there to kind of find that that, that intersection of supply and demand. Um, and but now what's happening is that's all efficiency. That's all kind of t- kind of price signaling and finding all that. And that's that's just being automated the more we, we become digital. Then the question becomes, what are we going to do? Where are the ideas going to come from to deal with sustainability, or where? How are we going to address the the, the 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 strategic development goals that the World Economic Forum has come up with? Now you're starting to see the marketplace, right? I teach at Duke University. My students, they don't want to go work for a company that they don't share an aspiration with. You know, what I mean, they has to be meaning. The meaning is the new money. Is kind of my mm-hmm. my <laughs> my metaphor for that with the students yeah. is that they really don't want to work somewhere where they don't believe in what it is that the company is doing. So if the marketplace is voting with its feet and saying, hey, if you don't clean up your act, literally, company, I'm not going to buy stuff from you. That's the consumer side of the marketplace. But there's also the talent side of the marketplace that says, if, you, if you're not doing something purposeful that has meaning, that's going to make my kid's life better, I don't want to work for you. So I think companies are feeling pressured from the power of the market on two sides. On one side, it's the commercial side. In other words, customers won't buy stuff from me. But on the other side, I think it's the talent marketplace. And I would argue that one's probably even more pernicious because, um, you know, what is an organization without people? It's just an agglomeration of what? Servers and chairs and screens. It's, it's impotent. It's, there, there's, no, there's no agency in the system that the humanity is not in. So therefore, you need to, I think companies need to clean up their act literally and figuratively in terms of having a true sense of purpose that can attract people and then, and, and then being, being authentic in their desire to create sustainable competitive advantage, not the way Michael Porter talked about it, sustainable meaning I can continue to win in this game 
um, but sustainable, meaning I'm doing good and doing well at the same time. And at, at Fuqua, our school, our business school is very much um, a stakeholder school where we believe that business can and must become a force for good in the world. Business has more to do than just generate profit in this in this new world. So Gary and, and, and Tony, the the hallmark of a good kind of graphic novel is that you associate with the characters and maybe is the person that we all want to associate with because you know they're trapped in this kind of you know bureaucratic system with leaders who are a little bit kind of blinkered um so t- tell us a little bit about this character and and you know how how you felt about her we open with maybe kind of looking at the the title of the book which is a show called everyday superhero I think she feels inside that she's someone who could raise herself to a new uh, point of inspiration and, you know, really, uh, but she's not being tapped and she's not being recognized and that's showing up in the reports about her. So when it's plopped in her lap to open up the opportunity that she's going to direct the change, not not direct, she has to recognize her own method uh, of, of making that change. Um, I think that I think that we see her go through a transformation as any great hero's journey uh, does mm-hmm. from the beginning and the end. And and with the help of a mentor who's future May. And I think that's uh, very exciting. And I, I think that the devices that we introduce, like the shift to later, which is kind of a clever little pun on shift to later, they're in this muck space, but they have to shift to a a place where May will lead with a very different type of example. And uh, that's a very exciting change to see. And, and then, so so the way we set up the narrative is May May's watching her favorite show. She didn't get promoted for the second year in a row. She's kind of having self-doubt. She feels she feels like she can contribute, but the system's not allowing her to. That's essentially it. Um, but then, circumstance dictates that all of a sudden, the FUD has arrived. And by the way, FUD, field undulating device, is also what we typically talk about and change: fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So that was we did we did kind of steal that one a little bit. We gave it a different name. But then the FIG, the field inversion gyroscope, that's the to counteract it. Now. Mm. You would never guess that this was going on during COVID when we're thinking about vaccines and shots and 8 billion people. Of course, there's there's a little bit of that narrative in there. The world needs 8 billion things as equivalent of, of, a, of a vaccine at that point in time. But they are then put in control. You are now in charge of this and let me give you the MERB. So it's like, and follow the MERB. If you don't follow the MERB, we're going to break your knees. So then they kind of fall into that model. But as you go through the first part of the book, you just see it becomes increasingly ludicrous trying to do trying to do this doesn't work. And then she has her epiphany with the help of the shift layer to say I'm going to do something different. What was hard about it from a from a this is where Gary and I think really had most of the creativity come out was in the MERB, there's kind of a set of rules, demand fail proof plans, measure outcomes, you know, project performance, and it's kind of linear. Mm. But in the in the in when you move to a people centered model. No one element was being applied. You had to create a compelling change narrative and lead the system, or you had to give others agency and catalyze a network, or you had to focus attention on what matters and motivate discretionary effort. You don't like do them sequentially, back to what we were talking about earlier, Scott, it's more like a spider's web. Mm-hmm. And, and so what, what we actually do in the book right, is whenever May is enacting the new changes, two or three of those leadership elements light up. It's not linear, and they, they different ones light up at different times because that's the whole nature of leadership here. It's a system and different components get activated in real time. So trying to go from a linear model to a network model and then demonstrating those behave, those multiple behaviors in real time inside Joseph Campbell's narrative, that's where I would say our creative challenge really lied. But then I think in terms of consuming it, you, you literally see May's transformation from trying to comply with the MERB to finding her own leadership sensibility and and those around her helping her do it so that was yeah. that was a really fun part i think when when, when the shift happens literally and w- that was actually one of the <laughs> one of the names we thought about the book was shift happens because every 
every element has three particular shifts that you that leaders need to do small shifts small incremental shifts but if everybody does it together then we'll we'll nudge the culture towards uh aspiration alignment autonomy and accountability and if you get those four things you get agility you get an organization that acts more like an organism than a machine and that can kind of flex and respond to whatever comes at it and and that's what i think most organizations need today usually half of the fortune 500 companies have disappeared since the year 2000. the average age of a company publicly traded in the united states has gone from 62 years 20 years ago to 35 years organizations in and of themselves are dealing with their own epidemic <laughs> they have their own mm -hmm. kind of problem and part of that problem i think is is this kind of weighted structure towards centralized hierarchy and it's yeah. just it doesn't necessarily adapt fast enough to the digital ecosystem it's trying to operate no and i think that that um that, that insight there around um change doesn't happen in a linear way um, right is yeah. interesting because if you think about most of the characters in the book they're trapped into a linear form of thinking which means they can't actually ever see what's going to happen until it happens Whereas the non-linear, and then it's too late, John. Yeah, then the non-linear network thinker is seeing yeah. potential options, and in, in parallel, it's thinking, you know, simultaneously. A lot of you know, so you can build scenarios and think about the future differently today. Yeah, there's uh, a there's a wonderful moment in the book where uh, where we realize that if you look down from the top of the building mm -hmm. straight down, then you have May kind of in the central of the center of that universe. We've got a conical building. And it's got the, you know, the mucks at the top. But when you squish it down and look at it that way, all of a sudden, the people who are really going to have an impact on how things improve at that company are part of a network. You know, they're flattened out. It may be the foreman way down in the basement. It may be the janitor on the second floor who serves as connective tissue. These people are elevated in importance as part of that network. So that was, uh, I remember when Tony suggested we do a... Uh, a Willy Wonka moment where the elevator shoots out of the top of the cone of the building and the floor, you look down through the glass floor and you see that the world is now a networked universe and that company is going to thrive in a way that it couldn't possibly thrive under the old model. And I, I got to jump in and be a geek on this one just because I love the name of your your, your podcast, right? The Evolving Leader. There's a... Um... There's, there's a technique called ONA, Organization Network Analysis. Uh, Rob Cross, who's a good friend of mine, was kind of probably the pioneer on it. But the idea is um, you ask people questions like, if you, had to leave, if you had to leave your job for two months, who would you give your work to? Or that, that's, that's about like, who, who, who do you think is good at performance? You know, like, you know, who, who, who do you want to be a proxy? Or it, um, if, 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 you were, if your company was going to go into some serious trouble, um, who, who would you follow? That's a leadership, that's a leadership question. Or um, if, if, if somebody has brought a deal to you that you think doesn't really stand up to the ethics of your company, who would you go ask? That's kind of a trust question. So you ask these very, very specific behavioral questions and you can put that together into an organizational network analysis. It's very different than the hierarchy. It's like, how does an organization really work? Uh, and what we found is in doing this research, when you ask that followership question, more than 30%, Rob's done more of this research, but I think we're on safe ground to say more than 30% of the people that people say they would follow are not represented in the hierarchy. So what that means is there's a lot more leadership in the organization than the hierarchy currently recognizes. And even more pernicious is the fact that some of the people who are in the hierarchy are not recognized as people that people would follow. So now mm -hmm. you've got another issue, right? It, depending on how you think yeah. about leadership. So that's why we thought at the end of the book, uh, John, you got to it. It's like when they're looking down, it's not the hierarchy. They're seeing the network. And May is the biggest node in the middle of the network because she is the kind of um, the source of energy, if you will, for that network to do what it does. And that's one of the big metaphors we're trying to get across. But it is rooted in, in strong research. There's not, there's not much controversy about that. From my perspective. Well, I think that's a, a, a brilliant place to, to bring our, our conversation to yeah. an end. Uh, re I mean, it's been wonderful. I really enjoyed the book and wish mm. you huge success with that. I know it's it's just about to, to kind of hit the bookshelf soon. Um, yeah. And we might even see it one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we got our copies before you, which I think is hilarious. But then, uh, you know, you do know what's inside it. So I think that's that's, that's okay. true. That's true. Um, yeah. 
thoroughly enjoy the time. Thank you for coming on. Uh, Thank really you. appreciate that. Thank you both. This has been great. Real fun. All right, friends, order your copy of Everyday Superhero today. And until next time, remember, the world is evolving. Are you? Are you?